from the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and people like you who are making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Malathopoulos, Associate Professor of Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. The show is called Pollination, but we almost entirely focus on the creatures that are transferring pollen from the uh, stamens of a flower uh, over to the stigma. And from there, the pollen tunnels its way down to the ovules and either sets a seed, well, sets a seed, which can result in a fruit. And when it comes to agricultural products, that means, you know, something really delicious or uh, seeds that can be used to grow things like carrots and onions and cauliflower and all those kinds of things. Now, the thing that we neglect on this show is the pollen itself. And that's why I'm so excited for this episode. We have uh, Jenna Walters. She is a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. Uh, She's working in Dr. Rufus Isaac's lab. And as you probably know, if you've listened to the episode a a bit, uh, there's a project that Dr. Isaacs is uh, leading up a national project to develop a pollination planner. Jenna's work is part of this, and she's looking at the um, impact of extreme heat on blueberry pollination. What happens to the pollen when it uh, lands on that stigma and it's really hot outside? So this week, we're going to turn up the heat, even though we're tending towards winter. We're going to turn up the heat with Jenna Walters talking about extreme heat and pollination. really delighted uh, to welcome you, Jenna, to Pollination. Thanks so much, Anthony. I'm excited to be here today. Well, all the way from Michigan, and I imagine Michigan's been like the rest of the country. We've had some weird weather this year, oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, here in Oregon, a really, really cool spring followed by, uh, you know, um, mildish, but we had some pretty hot days. And I, uh, I imagine many people, uh, you know, you know, look in their garden and they think uh, this has got to have an effect on pollination. Can you just walk us through um, the various mechanisms by which high and low temperatures might influence pollination? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's a very timely discussion um, because of the weird temperatures I think everyone is facing. Here in Michigan, we had it where uh, we had a high a high temperature spring, but our fall so far has been pretty pretty modest. So um, yeah, I think it's, we're all trying to figure out how high and low temperatures are, are impacting us in our pollination. And, and it's true, temperature is one of the most important uh, factors influencing pollination. Um, it impacts their functioning and their productivity um, of both the plants and the bees. So uh, uh-huh. I, think, I think it's helpful to break down um, how this is impacting pollination when we look at the two, the two organisms involved in pollination, the plant itself and it's, it's pollinator. So, um, so starting with low temperatures, um, you know, insects, specifically bees is what I study, but insects in general are, are cold-blooded animals, meaning that um, they have their resting body temperature is similar to the ambient temperature or, or outside temperature. And so when it's really cold, like freezing temperatures, um, insects are not going to be outside flying. Um, it will be, it would be very strange to see that. Um, but at, at temperatures that are cool, but not quite freezing, like 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, um, sometimes bees are able to thermoregulate. They're able to do certain things to, to warm up their bodies so that they can go out to um, pollinate things like blueberries in the spring, for example. Oh, so it's below so, the temperature that they can, but they figure out a way to kind of get that heat into their bodies and they do it. Exactly. Yeah. So because it's technically too cold outside for them to, to be moving, um, they do certain things to to warm up their bodies, just like, you know, getting a workout in, trying to amp yourself up. Um, and, and what bees do sometimes is they'll vibrate <laughs> their wing muscles. Um, so they'll they'll vibrate their wing muscles and warm up their bodies and they can do it pretty quickly, actually. Um, so that they become flight ready. Um, and so um, the colder it is outside, the longer it takes to um, to warm up, but they're able to uh, warm up to these temperatures. Um, but it does depend on the bee. So different bees have different um, um, abilities as well as um, you know behaviors to start foraging at, at different temperatures and different times. So um, I think bumblebees are a good example. 
of, of a bee that has been adapted and evolved to start foraging and moving at cooler temperatures and earlier in the season. So bumblebees are, are extremely hairy. They have mm-hmm. a large body size um, and they can vibrate their, their wing muscles as well. And so uh, they're able to start flying at cooler temperatures than other bees are, like uh, honeybees, for example. Um, so bumblebees here in the U.S. have evolved uh, in a lot of our regions that can be cooler. And so yeah. they can start flying earlier in the season. Um, but our European honeybee, um, a lot of the genetics and origins of honeybees c- comes from warmer, more Mediterranean places. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they are, they have evolved to endure higher temperatures um, and, and not fly as early as some of these um, North American native bees like bumblebees or mason bees like osmia bees. Well, for uh, sure, here, here in Oregon, uh, you will see a bumblebee in this state every month of the year. So yeah. our, our, the queens will emerge on the coast in January and uh, February. So we see them well before all that bee diversity that we see in July, it's really narrowed. And you have these bees that seem to not mind or have a capacity to be able to operate at low temperatures and you'll see them on these. Okay. That's good. All right. I understand that part. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so but you were saying that honeybees are not. And so uh, when Mm -hmm. you have spring season plants, things like mason bees and bumblebees, which may be more adapted, will fly at those temperatures. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, so, gotcha. so in the in this, so this is in the name of pollination, especially blueberry pollination. It's really important to have this diversity of pollinators, um, because in an event where spring is cold for you all in Oregon, um, maybe the honeybees are are you know looking at the honey they have in their hive and thinking, well, we don't need to start flying yet. It's really not too sunny out. Um, it's it's pretty cold, and so we're they don't have that same motivation to go out and forage where it, a bumble be, for example, who is trying to start her colony, start rearing her daughter workers, uh, she's she's much more motivated and physically capable of going to fly out uh-huh. sooner. And so um, so they'll start flying out in those cooler temperatures um, where some of your pollination services can still be met by these these native bees where maybe honeybees um, will will wait until it warms up a little bit more in the season after bloom has started a bit. Um, and vice versa, if, for example, it's too hot for bees, maybe it's nice to have um, bees that are more accustomed to higher temperatures. So so that diversity of, of bees is really important uh, for the different temperatures we're experiencing. You know, I remember a study, we're going to talk about uh, high bush blueberry in a bit, but I remember a study on high bush blueberry up in Canada where they use alfalfa leaf cutting bees. Oh, yeah. And they really didn't like it. They, they're a bee that is likes a, a hotter climate and it was hard to get them to work at the yeah. temperatures in the spring. Absolutely. Yeah. There are definitely bees who are uh, accustomed to warmer climates, warmer conditions, warmer time of year. And sometimes when we have these managed bees like alfalfa cutting bees, we can manipulate. Uh, so for those who don't know, alfalfa cutting bees are, are solitary bees. Uh, they are Uh, have little cocoons um, inside little leaf matter and we can pull them out um, and store them and then release them when we want them to start foraging on things. But they don't always work with us, um, even though we're managing them. And so uh, sometimes they they don't do so well um, when potentially it's too cold or too hot or just conditions are not right. Or maybe they don't like blueberries. That's, you know, another option is maybe um, maybe that bee isn't oh, a huge fan of, of blueberries in general. Right, right. Um, but anyways, so the, with it, when it comes to bees, it's kind of like Goldilocks, too hot, yeah. too cold. It, you know, there may be some bees that really exploit those niches. Yeah. Um, um, but, and so when you have these extreme weather conditions, you may have these, you know, you, uh, uh, what I got out of this is a diversity of bees will help you in some, to some extent, buffer some of these yeah. extremes. Well, and yes and no. So yes, in the way of, of temperature fluctuations to a certain degree, and sometimes depending on the extremes, yes, but also, um, there are some times where extremes are so high and, and the impact of them is, is kind of universal. And so, um, you mm. know, getting back to like the comparison of, of, of insects and as well as plants and how those, wow. yeah. um, endure different temperatures. Um, so, 
you know, sometimes when extremes are, are too intense, it, it can have this um, overwhelming impact on, on the whole system itself. So both, both the, the plant as well as its, its bee pollinator. So um, um, under cold temperatures with, with plants in particular, um, as well as a lot of the bees, uh, the, the cooler temperatures, but not extremely cold, not totally freezing. If we had a, a total freeze out, things would not be doing very well. But at a cooler temperature, um, it, it takes the bees as well as the plants a little bit longer um, to, to develop normally and to get started in their in their growing season. So um, so for pollen, which is the uh, the male uh, part, the male um, uh, gametophyte is what we call it, or, or essentially the sperm of a plant. Uh -huh. um, that is is what carries the genetic material, and so when something becomes pollinated, that uh, male gametophyte or the pollen grain is placed on the female part of a flower. Um, so in a flower, that that big thing in the middle of a flower uh, is the a circular part is the stigma, which is the sticky part of the female organ of a flower, which is where uh -huh. the pollen needs to land for uh -huh. uh, pollen germination and tube growth to happen. Um, and kind of like a seed, um, a pollen grain will uh, germinate a pollen tube. And essentially that pollen tube oh. is the, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So the, these pollen tubes will, um, they will uh, emerge from the pollen grain itself. It carries the genetic material from that pollen grain towards the ovary of a flower. Um, and if it successfully fertilizes the ovaries of that flower, then it will uh, produce seeds. And in blueberries, for example, um, the better pollination, the better fertilization um, of the seeds means that bigger and better, sweeter fruit that we're going to get. Uh, so, okay. all right. so we need all of these systems in place where we need this pollinator to collect pollen, to place on the stigma of a flower, to then fertilize that flower so that we get this end product that, that us people, humans care about, which is that fruit. Okay. Um, so under cold temperatures, it it is still able to um, these are still able to fly. The pollen is still able to germinate. It just takes a little bit longer. Things are a bit uh, lethargic, if you will, under the cooler temperatures. That pollen tube that you were describing, it it, it will uh, germinate maybe slowly and grow down to the ovary slowly, but it happens. It, it doesn't yeah. stop. Okay, gotcha. it never stops. It just takes a little bit longer. Exactly. Okay. Um, and that, that is a, an important comparison because it is very different under high temperatures, both for the bees as well as for the plant. So um, starting with the plant, uh, we did work here at Michigan State University where we looked at how blueberry pollen was responding to high temperatures um, and whether or not it was able to still germinate and produce those pollen tubes and how fast those pollen tubes were able to grow. Oh. And um, what we found was that at high temperatures, um, at temperatures over 95 degrees, um, at or above 95 degrees, I should say, um, those pollen grains are, are essentially killed. So they are not able to function normally at that point. Um, and so when they land on a stigma, or in my case, uh, when they're on my nutrient medium of my Petri dish, um, the pollen grain will sit there and it won't produce a pollen tube. It won't germinate and there's no growth that's happening. And um, we also tested it where we did short periods of extreme heat, even just four hours of um, high temperature exposure and then putting it back into normal conditions, say around 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, just those four hours was enough for that pollen grain to be killed and to not germinate, uh, not producing pollen tubes. And, you know, naturally then not fertilize a, a flower um, because the heat essentially killed that pollen. All right. Let me get this and, straight. So if, uh, yeah. if 95 degrees for four hours, which I can imagine for uh, many early season crops, well, for blueberry in particular can happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Pollen it, green it, lands yeah. on the stigma and it's already dead. It yep. won't germinate. Okay. Right. Oh, and it wow. has happened. So um, so the reason I started the the research I, I do is because in, in Michigan in 2018, we had a heat wave that happened during blueberry bloom. Uh, we were about mid-bloom. And uh, this heat wave happened where we had 
for several hours over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And our growers reported a 30 to 50 percent yield loss that year compared to just the year prior. um, And because these pollen grains were landing and they just didn't do anything. Right. So it was far at at the time we had no idea, you know, everyone looked at each other and said, we're, we're stocking honeybees. The worst way we're supposed to be, these honeybees are healthy. Um, You know, our, we had good flowers and, you know, all these other factors seem to be, you know, teeing up to a good yield year, but then this heat wave happened during bloom. And, and there was, you know, this massive consequence of, of 30 to 50% yield loss of millions of dollars for our Michigan um, blueberry industry. And um, so knowing that that heat was, was the, you know, a uh, common denominator of what was causing potentially some of these issues. That's, that's what caused um, uh-huh. me and, and Dr. Rufus Isaacs to start, to start looking into this for our growers. And um, so, so what we found was that um, at, and this is, is pretty across the board um, at these temperatures over 95 degrees Fahrenheit, these, these pollen grains are not performing. They're not fertilizing flowers. Um, they're being killed off. And um, that's super important for our, our industry and for our crop. But at the same time, um, the the whole reason that bees are visiting plants is not to pollinate. They don't know that they're pollinating, but they're visiting those plants and collecting nectar and pollen for their own diet and for their own nutrition and for the nutrition of their offspring. And so it made us think, you know, if the nutrition or other things uh, that is stopping the pollen from germinating or producing a pollen tube under high temperatures, does that have an impact on the nutrition of uh, the pollen itself when bees are eating it? Um, and and it, it turns out so far, uh, it seems like it does have a, a big impact. What If a, a host plant like blueberry has been exposed to extreme heat, again, for just four hours, not several days, not throughout their whole growing period, but for four hours during bloom, while those flowers are developing and opening, um, we're finding that bees are not developing normally. Um, We're finding that that they're not developing to adulthood, or if they are surviving into adulthood, they're not surviving as long as what they could have under under normal conditions. If they ate pollen, exposed to uh, normal conditions. Um, and that's an indirect impact of, of extreme heat. But um, bees are also extremely sensitive to direct extreme heat. So um, it's a lot easier for a bee to warm up than it is for a bee to cool down. Um, some bees have evolved different strategies, mostly social bees, um, bees that are living in a hive or a colony. Um, they've evolved certain behavioral strategies like wing fanning. So before for warming up, we were talking about vibrating your wing muscles to warm up. But now under high temperatures, they can do these behaviors called wing fanning, where essentially they're able to, to ventilate uh, their hive or their colony to uh, try to keep a, a pretty stable temperature. Um, but social bees are um not the most common bee or pollinator in the world by any means. 90% of our world's bees are solitary. And so they don't have behaviors to um, to help or um, maintain their broods uh, temperature conditions or, or growing conditions in general. And so um, they're not able to wing fan or cool down a nest once they've laid their egg uh, if there is high temperature stress. And so um, our solitary bees, which um, don't get any uh, brood care from sister workers, daughter workers, or a queen, um, they are left to fend for themselves and, and are certainly at risk when uh, enduring high temperatures because that can, again, lead to um, malformations in their bodies. It can um, hinder development of wings or their legs, important body parts needed for pollination services. Um, can also hinder memory, uh, which is really important for, again, our social bees that um, need to uh, remember where they're going, where their hive is, or, um, you know, where the food resource is. Um, And in general, it just, it causes higher rates of of mortality in general. Um, But like the cold temperatures, depending on the bee, some bees are better equipped to handle high temperatures than others. Um, in part, that's their their body. So, um, you know, their body size, the amount of hair that they have, 
behavioral um, um, mechanisms they might have to, to help cool themselves and, and their sisters and offspring. Um, and so our social bees are, are actually um, more, uh, are better equipped to handle some of these high temperatures than, than our solitary bees. Um, and honeybees in particular are pretty good at handling high temperatures uh, compared to bumblebees, because like we talked about with the cold temperatures, bumblebees have these large bodies, hairy bodies, um, and that makes them great candidates for pollinating in the cold, but uh, it can definitely stress them out when things get too hot. Um, our uh, honeybee, which has evolved in hotter, more Mediterranean climates, um, doesn't have uh, as much intense body hair and is a little bit smaller in body size in general, they're able to manage and deal with those higher temperatures a bit better um, than a lot of our other bees are. I want to come back around to the pollen. I found that fascinating. Yeah. So um, just explain your experimental setup. How on earth did you do you know that the pollen isn't viable? And I imagine it's there's an all or nothing temperature, 95, but I imagine when things are just a little bit warmer but not quite there other you know it may germinate or the rate of germination tell us a little bit about how you measure this like you talk yeah. about petri dishes like how do you do this yeah yeah it's it is a fascinating world for sure so <laughs> so what we do is we uh we grow our blueberries um in the greenhouse keep them under uh, normal conditions and then um what we do is we will pick off a flower at um, as soon as it opens within one day of a flower opening, um, because that's the time that that pollen is actually most viable or, um, you know, as productive as what it can be. And so we'll pick off a flower from a plant and um, we have this uh, nutrient medium that um, uh, another researcher here at MSU uh, some time ago developed that is specific to blueberry. Uh -huh. Um, it's, uh, essentially the nutrient medium is mimicking the surface of a flower stigma. And so both of the, the flower stigma surface uh -huh. and the chemicals on a flower stigma surface are, are similar to what we have in this nutrient medium where once pollen is landed on it, it, it essentially, um, uh, tells that pollen grain time to wake up, time to get, to get going. Let's okay. start germinating. Okay. Oh, how fascinating. So we have this this nutrient uh, medium, this agar on a petri dish, and we will use um, a sonication tool. So we use um, a, a little bee tool, but you could also use something like um, an electronic toothbrush um, because blueberries need sonication for pollen to be released from its anthers. Um, it's, it has what we call portical anthers. And so um, it needs a certain frequency for that pollen to be released which is um, the similar frequency to the wing vibration of a bumblebee. So it performs- I've done it with a tuning fork. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get tuning that tuning fork, fork ding, and it all comes yep. out, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So we've done, we've used some Colgate electronic toothbrushes. We've done a <laughs> tuning fork. I found these really cute little bee pollinator wands that oh. seems to do the trick. And it's, you know, a nice little bee swag at the same time. So got <laughs> have to do it for the look. Um, <laughs> So we use these tools and it makes the pollen get released from a flower and we're able to spread it across the surface of an agar. And then we'll put it into uh, growth chambers uh, set to the temperature we're interested in. And so we, we've we looked at a wide range of temperatures as low as 50 degrees Fahrenheit and as high as 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then different temperatures um, with within that range. Um, and uh, what we'll do is we, we put them in there and we'll check it at two time periods. So we check it at four hours and then at 24 hours. Uh -huh. And uh, under a light microscope, we will... Uh, measure the whether or not a, a pollen grain germinated or essentially did has a pollen tube emerged from oh. a blueberry pollen grain so you see uh, this little little pollen grain and out pops this little finger i guess yeah yeah it is like a huh. little finger popping out and and blueberry huh. um blueberry pollen grains are actually uh they're formed in tetrads so there's actually four pollen grains that are fused together and oh. so yeah, which is really, it's cool. And it's, um, you know, it's helpful for the plant because that means, okay, more chances for my, this genetic material to get carried down into, um, into the, the ovary of a plant. And because it's fused together like that, it's a little bit stickier. And so it sticks to a bee body a bit better as well. Um, oh, okay. because it's, cool. it's in that, that tetrad form. And so, um, so there's four potential pollen tubes that can be produced from a, a blueberry 
pollen tetrad. And um, so we'll under our microscope, we'll say, okay, how many pollen tubes have germinated from X number of pollen grains? Uh, and what is the length of those pollen tubes? How much have they grown in X amount of time? So at our four and 24 hour mark. And, um, and generally it's within, a, you know, 24 under normal conditions. That's when uh, a pollen grain should success, successfully traverse to a um, ovary and then fertilize that. So um, under normal conditions around 24 hours to 48 hours is, is how long it takes. So, um, so we'll put them in at our different temperatures, we'll measure them, and then I get onto R and I do my data analysis and I see how that looks. Um, and even just observationally at the higher temperatures, you'll look under the microscope and see those all those blueberry pollen tetrads and um, they actually will form little halos around them. So there'll be no pollen tubes that are produced, but there's a little halo around them because when a pollen tube is done growing, um, whether it be in a flower or on a Petri dish, uh, at the end, when it's done growing, it will release its genetic material uh, or in uh, the field, it's, a, it's called a burst. It, it bursts out that genetic material at the end of the pollen tube. And um, what we were seeing with these pollen grains was that it was kind of just at the surface level because it couldn't produce any pollen tubes. It wasn't able to grow any. It just kind of bursted this genetic material around the, the tetrad itself. Um, and so in nature, if one of these heat waves happened and a pollen grain landed on a stigma, um, in that situation, a, a pollen tube wouldn't form or not very many of them would form. If they did, they wouldn't grow very much. It would grow very little, more than likely not reach the ovary of a flower. And um, and so when it releases that genetic material, it's not going to be releasing it at the right spot or maybe not at the right time. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Or not be as viable as ma genetic material as what it could be. And so all of these factors lead to the yield loss that that we've seen here in Michigan and, and in other areas where there's extreme heat happening during bloom um, because essentially the, the heat is, is, you know, in many ways, uh, uh, disrupting, uh, the chemical development and the chemical profile of, of those things. If you think about us as, as humans, when we go outside and it's really, really hot outside, when we go through things like heat stroke, it's because the proteins in our body become, um, uh, malformed or become, uh, disrupted because the heat is so intense, it, it disrupts our proteins in our body. And it does a similar thing with, with pollen. Um, and the whole reason that bees are visiting pollen in the first place is, or visiting flowers in the first place is to get that pollen um, for its protein. So in the, in the pollination world, uh, the reason a, a bee is visiting a flower is to get its sugars or carbohydrates from the nectar and its proteins from the pollen. Um, and so uh, we have, we're still investigating this, but we have, uh, uh, we have a theory that, uh, it's the nutrition that is, is the reason why these pollen tubes are, are not performing on, in the plant under high temperatures and why maybe these bees, um, are, are not developing normally or are not surviving when they're, huh. it's eating pollen from, uh, plants that have been exposed to extreme heat even if those bees themselves haven't been exposed to extreme heat and they've been under normal conditions, we're still seeing negative effects on those bees. I suppose this raises the question. I know lots of growers here, uh, high bush blueberry in the Pacific Northwest, um, noticed that some plants were worse off from the, uh, the heat than before uh, others. And it could be because the pollination largely took place before the heat event. But are there uh, cultivar differences between how... Um, uh, the, you know, these uh, heat heat events impact the flowers uh, capacity. I mean, it gets to pollen grains to germinate or yeah. I guess other other aspects of the flower. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good point. And it's, again, something I that we're starting to get into more. Uh, the short answer is yes. It seems like there are differences in how different cultivars are responding. Um, we also tested, uh, so I focus here in Michigan, I focus on Northern high bush, but also was assessing Southern high bush uh, which are grown in hotter climates typically. Um, and, and for both of them, we found that they are, the different cultivars are responding differently to temperatures. Uh -huh. um, there seems to be a trend where the earlier blooming varieties seem to be better acclimated to the cold and the later blooming varieties seem to be better acclimated to the heat. So, um, so 
under um, these cooler um, temperatures, huh. um, you know, the ones that are flowering a bit earlier, maybe their pollen tubes are going a little bit faster at those cooler temperatures than the later blooming varieties. Um, but I, but again, with the extreme, extreme heat, we are seeing across the board um, at temperatures, uh, specifically 99, uh, 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit is the absolute cutoff of across the board. Things are not doing well. Things are not developing normally. Um, pollen is pretty much absolutely killed at that point. At 95 degrees, it's definitely a, a pretty stark decline, but some are doing a little bit better than others. Um, but but at, at, you know, just a couple degrees hotter is is where we're seeing the point of, of no return, if you will, when it comes to pollen performance. But, um, you know, there's still hope. I think, again, in the same way that we want a diversity of bee pollinators that are able to endure and experience different temperatures, uh, you know, a bumblebee foraging when it's cooler, a honeybee foraging when it's a little bit hotter, I think is uh, another reason why we need a diversity of cultivars that we're growing. Um, some cultivars are going to be doing okay. Their pollen is going to be okay under hotter temperatures or cooler temperatures, depending on the season that we're having. And so it, it allows a, a little bit of resilience, if you will, within that system mm -hmm. um, where uh, we still hopefully can get some crop um, if if we have a diversity of the different cultivars that we're growing versus if we all are growing one cultivar and it is all extremely sensitive to high temperatures, then, you know, we're, we're going to largely lose out on, on any potential yield that we could have. So that diversity in both the pollinators and the plants themselves are, are really important for resilience in this, you know, age of climate change. Do growers have any other, there's that uh, diversity of pollinators, diversity of cultivars to just hedge your bets against um, extreme weather events. I was thinking, you know, when you look at cherry growers, for example, they have those big fans. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. anything that um, blueberry growers um, can do uh, to deal with these uh, heat events? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, we're we're investigating it a bit. Uh, hopefully, we'll be getting some some good data soon from some of our growers here in Michigan. But but one tool that we've started to encourage people to do is uh, using overhead irrigation. Oh. So yeah, so a lot of our blueberry growers, both in the Pacific Northwest as well as here in Michigan, have these um, overhead irrigation systems um, where um, we're we're able to do uh, essentially evaporative cooling. So if there is a time where extreme heat is happening, um, if we have a threshold temperature, so for us, we're saying our threshold temperature is 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, if it's, it's approaching or has reached that temperature, turn on your overhead irrigation for, you know, a, a couple minutes, you know, to a half hour, um, as long as it stays within that high temperature range. Um, and it's really effective at cooling those fields. So through that, um, you know, evaporative cooling uh, process, it can cool the, the temperature around the canopy um, of the blueberries by about 10 to 15 degrees. And we actually got so it's this like a idea short of, burst. It's a little bit, yeah. you're not like turning irrigation on all day. You're giving it a short burst. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Short bursts of, of so mm. um, we, we actually got the idea from researchers out in Oregon um, who were doing this for blueberries when the berries were developing. And so they didn't want the berries to get uh, too hot while they were uh, ripening. And um, and so we used those same tactics that they were doing uh, with berry ripening, but are now putting it uh, in fields while blooms are happening or while flower opening is occurring. And, and we're seeing really, really good results where uh, turning on overhead irrigation for 15 minutes every hour, it's over a threshold temperature. So again, not the whole time, just for a few minutes. Um, it was able to cool temperatures in that field by 10 to 15 degrees. Wow. And in, in the case of how pollen is performing, that's absolutely essential. It's enough to save that pollen from being able to normally for, you know, fertilize and develop on a plant versus not at all. Uh, and it also is important for the, the bee pollinators that we're trying to keep within that landscape to perform these pollination services year after year. Um, that means that, that they're going to have a higher quality of food as well. 
um, when we can effectively cool those fields. So um, we're, we're excited about the use of overhead irrigation as a tactic to cool fields. Um, we're still exploring whether or not, uh, ha if it has an impact on things like disease, diseases in, in blueberries and oh, disease management. because there's all sorts of fruit blights. I mean, flower right. blights. Yeah, yeah. Right. So a lot of the a lot of the diseases we're worried about um, during bloom are spread through water, and so uh, it's it's a concern that we have. But I think a, a grower I talked to about this recently brought up a good point where he said, you know, I'd rather have to deal with a little bit of of diseases and manage those than not have a crop at all. Um, uh -huh. So there there is um, you know there's always a, a give and take if you will, but um, we're pretty sure at this point that following up these overhead irrigations during extreme heat, if if growers are following it up by using uh, fungicides and um, you know all the rest, then um, be able to you know, mitigate even that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But but besides that, you know, there's not a lot we can do with our our ever changing climate. Uh, you're not we're not able. I, I wish we could just say stop being so hot and, you know, it could flip like a switch. But that is that's not the world we live in. So we do have to to figure out tools and, um, you know, mitigation strategies so that we don't have um, these devastating impacts in our yields and our and our crops and um, and then the bees that that also rely on it uh, as their food and as their resources as well. Well, this is great work, and I, I think you know in terms of climate adaptation, this is exemplary in in trying to um, kind of think about creative solutions. Um, but let's take a quick break. Uh, we do have a section that we uh, um, grill uh, our. Um, guests on. Uh, um, really curious to see your answers. Yeah. We'll be back in just one second. Awesome. <laughs> okay, we are back. Um, so uh, at the break, we were just talking a little bit about, you know, the other considerations that, you know, you were measuring the pollen and it, but that it, there may be other places in the flower that are impacted by heat maybe just kind of um uh let's re recapitulate this argument like what, 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 I, I think i asked about ovaries i was like oh aren't the ovaries yeah. sensitive but you said that there yeah. was a lot more tell us a little bit about what you told me <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely so so what we know um across the board pretty much for for uh, plant reproduction research is that the the male gametophyte or or the organs and the um uh, the pollen itself, the genetic material, if you will, the male genetic material is by and large the most sensitive to extreme heat um, more than any other development stage, including the female organs, including vegetative growth, et cetera. Uh, but it's not it's not that these other organs in developmental stages are not also um, stressed out with with high temperatures. It's just not as much as um, as the pollen and um, the anthers. Um, which are the the organs that are helping produce pollen in a flower, and so ovaries can and the stigma and style of uh, the female parts of a flower also can be uh, really sensitive to to high temperatures. And um, there's been some studies in uh, in cherries and in peaches where. Uh, when they expose the whole flower to high temperatures and then try to um, pollinate it, essentially the the mucus secretion or uh, the the sticky surface on the stigma of a flower dries up, or the the chemical compounds that are on that stigma surface are have changed. And so, even if a pollen grain was totally healthy and viable and normal, um, it's not going to be able to develop on that stigma because um, that condition that Ooh. conditions are no longer being met on the female side of things. Um, and so certainly it is a, a combination of factors. It's not just the pollen that is stressed out with the heat. It's the whole system itself that is stressed out by heat. Um, and, and the plant uh, essentially prioritizing where it's going to save itself. Um, and so uh, a, a perennial plant like blueberries are, are much more focused on surviving to the next year. Uh, if they are not as reproductively active that given season, they're more willing to give that up than um, than for the whole plant to die because they're putting too much energy into reproduction oh, sure. for yeah. that season. So, um, so they're under 
bouts of, of high temperatures, the reproduction is kind of the, the first to go. They're going to prioritize um, spending energy protecting um, its chloroplast and its leaves and making sure that its vegetative growth above ground and below ground, uh, its root systems are all of those are, are staying, um, you know, nominal, if you will. Um, but the reproductive stages being more sensitive, being much more costly in terms of energy, um, they're more, it's more willing to be sacrificed. But it's losses. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so definitely a, a combination of these different developmental stages and, and how heat is impacting all of them and the whole functioning of that system. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying that and adding that to the conversation. And uh, now for the fun part. So we got three questions to <laughs> ask our guests. The first one is, do you have a book recommendation for our, uh, our listeners? Absolutely. Um, I highly recommend, and, and maybe someone has recommended this as well. I think a lot of ecologists love this book, but um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer. We've had a few um, recommendations. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is definitely one of my favorite books. And when I have um, students who are leaving the lab and moving into the next stage of life, I always give that to them. It's a it's a really beautiful set of, uh, of stories and essays com- combining, um, you know, the natural world and our love for the natural world in a very poetic way, while also um, including some really interesting ecological theories and um, observations and um, all by in incredible indigenous woman scholar, Rob Wall Kimmer, who's um, an ecologist that I, I deeply admire. So that is, uh, I think, for anyone who is a lover of nature um, or loves to read a good story, um, it's it's one of, one of the greats, in my opinion. What a wonderful recommendation. Um, the next question I have is, is there a go-to tool for the work that you do? And I imagine I can just, you mentioned a number of them along the way, but what's your go-to tool that you can't do without? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think that my fancy little buzz pollination tool with the <laughs> little bee has, has to be my go-to. Uh, I, I've been collecting pollen for years and years. I've had my students collect pollen with me for years and years. And uh, I've had, I've had many of hours at this point with that bee pollination tool in hand. So uh, I, I don't think I'd I'd have the work that I'm sharing here today if I didn't have it. So shout out to the bee pollination tool. All right. We'll have these linked in the show notes so that you too can have a bee pollination tool and braiding sweet, gla- sweet grass. Okay. So last one, uh, your favorite pollinator. Yeah, this is the hardest question ever. And I'm sure everyone says that. Um, but I have to go Osmia lignaria or um, the blue orchard bee. It's the the bee that I study um, for, for my work, but I just think it's the coolest little bee. There are these, um, it's a solitary bee. And so I think that is really fascinating. Um, it's solitary life cycle. It's a mason bee, meaning it uses um, mud to line its cells. And I just think it's adorable to see a bee collecting mud. Um, tucking between its legs to make its baby's home a little bit more cozy. Um, And they just look really awesome. They are metallic blue and shiny and iridescent. And um, they're one of the first bees to come out in the spring. And so it's always a true delight to see them when uh, here in Michigan, we go through our our very long gray cold (laughs) winters. It's nice to see a really cool iridescent blue bee early in the spring, just, uh, just going crazy on, on some of our favorite, favorite, uh, foods, flowers. So they love blueberry. They love cherries and apples and, um, uh, peaches, lots of different, uh, things in the rose family and the vaccinium family of plants. So, uh, they're hard workers and, uh, I just think they're super cool. Oh, and I guess in about a month we'll be, uh, um, processing our cocoons. And for those of you who are, uh, in the Oregon area, the Lynn County Mester Gardeners have it. B notes. It's a um, uh, a great service where they'll email you what to do at uh, each stage of the season. So sign up for B notes. We'll have that in the show notes. And I want to really thank you, Jenna, for taking time to walk us through this very intricate process, but clearly one that is of high consequence as we think about the future. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me. This has been a blast. Really appreciate it. 
Thank you so much for listening. Show notes with links from each episode are available at the website, pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's a form at the website where you can pop in and say hello and give me feedback. If you want to support the show, remember to leave a rating on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever podcast mothership you use. And finally, if you have the means and you want to help support my lab's effort to document bee biodiversity in Oregon, visit OregonBeeAtlas.org and follow down to the donate button where you can make a tax deductible donation to the Jerry and Judith Paul Native Pollinator Endowment. Every little bit helps. See you next episode.